So I'd like to thank Shockwave for inviting us here today to discuss the PAD3 observational below the knee interim analysis. I'm George Adams, interventional cardiologist here at Rex Hospital, part of the UNC system. These are my disclosures, which are not pertinent to this presentation. So let's talk a little bit about the background. So if we look at infrapopliteal arterial calcium, we always talk about animal calcium, but medial calcification is more prevalent in infrapopliteal arteries. If you think about it, your vessels are sort of like an onion, right? So you got three layers. You got the inner layer, the intimal segment, the middle layer, the medial segment, and the outer layer, the adventitia. Again, the medial calcification is more prevalent in this, in this area. What this means is, is that it contributes to wall stiffness, vessel recall, and ultimately restenosis, and ultimately leads to increased periprocedural complications such as perforation, embolization, et cetera. Percutaneous transluminal angioplasty of calcified infrapopliteal lesions is associated with suboptimal procedure outcomes, results in early vessel recall, and may contribute to restenosis. I mean, just think about the mechanisms, mechanism of plain old balloon angioplasty. The mechanism is to dissect the vessel and ultimately can lead to these complications. While promising results with intravascular lithotripsy have been reported in a small pilot study, real world evidence from a larger cohort, cohort is lacking. So if we think about the mechanism of intravascular lithotripsy, so as you can follow me to the far left here, so we deliver a catheter and inflate to low pressure. So what we're trying to do is just get apposition of balloon, the balloon against the vessel wall, not to cause bear trauma, not to open the wall with the balloon, but to actually allow the device to oppose the wall so we can deliver therapy. We then generate sonic pressure waves using lithotripsy. Now, when we, when we uh, generate these sonic waves, as you can see here to, to the right, one pulse per second is as ad effective pressure of approximately 50 atmospheres. What this allows us to do is to crack the calcium. This modifies the plaque, it's controlled breaks in the calcium. If you look below at this pathology slide that Renew Vermontity is very, very eloquently shown, we get these cracks and it's not, these cracks aren't just intimal, but they're deep cracks, which happen in the media. So ultimately what this allows us to do is safely and predictably expand this vessel such that we don't have as much inflammation. We don't get these complications of dissection and ultimately our hope is to prevent vessel recall. So I'd like to introduce first the Disrupt PAD3 observational study. Remember, planned enrollment is 1,500 patients and the objective was to assess real world periprocedural outcomes of IVL for treatment of calcific stenotic peripheral arteries. The PAD3 observational interim analysis was IVL treatment for of calcific infrapopliteal arteries. So far, 101 patients, 114 below the knee lesions at 15 global sites, with the majority of them being in the United States. The tool used to treat these calcific vessels was the S4 IVL device. And as you can see here to the right, it treats vessel diameters between 2.5 and 4 millimeters, have a, has a 40 millimeter length balloon for treatment. 20 pulses per cycle with a max pulse count of 160. The baseline characteristics, so the demographics of the population, they were older, about 73 uh, years of age on average, your typical comorbidities with about 75% of them being diabetic, about half of them being renally insufficient and a quarter of them being on dialysis. As you can see here to the right, about 70% of the patient population had critical limb ischemia, meaning they were Rutherford 4 to Rutherford 6. If we look at the lesion characteristics, as you can see, the lesions per patient on average were 1.1. The reference vessel diameter was about three millimeters. The diameter stenosis was about 85% with a min minimum lumen diameter of 0.5 millimeters. About 35% of these had chronic total occlusions. 
And what's also interesting, if you look at moderate to severe calcification, and we see this in studies, the core lab adjudicated was about 70% compared to someone like myself thinking that the total population was 100%. Now remember, core lab is just using uh, the angiogram. And I don't wanna say just using, but uses the angiogram solely. Whereas a physician is in the, in the case and sometimes we look at the lesion a little bit differently. You know, we use it the wire to give us some uh, sensation, some tactile feedback. We also look at the angiogram. We look at the patient and some of these lesions, you know, they're tougher to cross. And that may be one of the discrepancies between these two numbers. When we look at lesion location, the majority of them were either anterior tibial or tibioperineal trunk, as you can see. And the minority were the posterior tibial and perineal at about 17% each. Now, this is a typical case. This is, as you can see here to the far left, an angiogram uh, that's not subtracted, and you can actually see the calcium without any subtraction. So a typical case with calcium below the knee, the anterior tibial is the focus uh, for this patient. And you can uh, um, evaluate the angiogram and see there are multiple chronic total occlusions throughout the anterior tibial with the posterior circulation, the TP trunk, PT and perineal occluded. We're able to cross this lesion with a wire and used a three millimeter um, IVL, uh, as you can see here on the second slide, getting a very nice result. And then with the junctive balloon angioplasty, as you can see here to the far right, um, uh, opening of the vessel to a less than 30% residual diameter and no complications or having to place a metallic scaffold or stent. When we look at the procedural characteristics of the actual study, um, as you can see, the procedure time was about 88 minutes, total procedure time with a fluoroscopy time of about 21 minutes. There was about 3% of the time people used embolic protection. 28% of the time, there was some sort of predilatation. So sometimes if the lesion's too tight and before we place the IVL, we'll go in there with a balloon to predilate the, uh, the lesion. In terms of IVL catheters, 1.1, which we mentioned earlier, Standalone IVL therapy, when we're just looking at devices to treat or, or to prep the vessel or modify the plaque, 77% of the time, it was just IVL therapy alone. And then about a quarter of the time, adjunctive calcific modifying therapies were used in addition to IVL. If you look to the right, 8% of that time, it was focal force balloons or specialty balloons. And about 16% of the times it was atherectomy. In addition, we've also listed about 15% of the time drug-coated balloons were used, as well as 11% of the time a metallic scaffold or stent was placed. In terms of the angiographic outcomes, very, very good, especially in this moderate to severe calcific cohort. 83% was the stenosis pre-procedure. Post-IVL, you got less than 30% residual, is about 28%. And then with an adjunctive therapy, it came down to 23%. Looking at complications, they were low. Post-IVL, dissections about 3% of the time. And there was one case that there was a distal emboli. But if you look um, as total, the complication rate was extremely low. In conclusion, the interim analysis of this real-world Disrupt PAD3 observational study represents the largest cohort for IVL treatment of heavily calcific infrapalpatial arteries and the initial experience using the Shockwave S4 IVL catheter. Acute outcomes following IVL uh, treatment demonstrated a significant reduction in diameter stenosis immediately following IVL treatment and then minimal vascular complications with no serious angiographic complications at the end of the procedure. The treatment approach was per the operator's discretion in this real world registry. In fact, calcific modified adjunctive therapies was used in 23% of these cases in this initial S4 PTK treatment experience. And then as well as 95% of these cases were performed in the US. So this gives you more of a, of a United States experience rather than uh, the rest of the world. 
Future studies with long-term follow-up are needed to understand the durability of IVL treatment in calcific infrapalpiteal arteries. Did the results meet my expectations using this S4 IVL device in infrapalpiteal arteries? Absolutely. You know, there's a paucity of, de of devices that we can use below the knee to modify plaque. And then when we take a cohort, especially this moderate to severe calcific cohort, there's a lack of devices to modify this plaque to prevent um, complications as well as um, to have good feasibility. In other words, do they work? Do they modify the plaque such that you get adequate opening of the vessel without having to place a metallic scaffold? And as you saw by these results, um, it, it worked very effectively and was extremely safe. I believe that IVL is, is extremely beneficial in treating calcific lesions, and this is supported by the data we've just discussed. You know, when you look at um, the realm of of uh, plaque morphologies, homogeneous to calcific with heterogeneous being in the middle and restenotic plaque also being one of those plaque characteristics. I strongly believe that you choose the device to treat the plaque, it's personalized care. In the instance of calcium, especially moderate and severe calcium, this device is very, very um, uh, is, is uh, beneficial in modifying that plaque type. When we, when we ask ourselves, well, why is that? You know, well, what, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, our goal is to modify that calcific plaque such that if you need to use another adjunctive therapy, such as just plain old balloon angioplasty, you don't get a significant complication, number one. Number two is you decrease the inflammatory burden that happens in that vessel such that you don't get acute restenosis or, or exacerbated restenosis this neo-intimal hyperplasia. And then lastly is recoil. If there's a way to prevent recoil in this, in this small vessel, um, then that's what we would prefer. And let me mention that we are currently studying uh, the effects of IVL on recoil uh, in a recoil study, and hopefully we'll have that data out pretty soon um, to see uh, how IVL affects recoil in this uh, moderate to severe calcific group.